Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. If you go on the Athletic website right now, you can find Chris Johnston's trade board. We're going to get to some players on that trade board later in today's show. We're going to do some checks around the league with a few teams. It's Thursday as well, so we'll have stick taps. But I'd like to start with the team that's in your backyard, CJ. Earlier this week, we had a conversation about the Leafs. I felt you were pretty level-headed, reasoned, you know, even keel. And we need more of that talking about this team. Uh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, I guess. I guess there are some fans who don't necessarily feel that way, especially now that they've the lost four in a row. They've, up, blow, the they've blown leads in each right of them. Now. They are fired up. It's just like, I, I know sometimes whenever I talk about this team, I go in and I'm like, man, you know, maybe we should just calm down. And everyone looks at me just really weird. Like you, you ever tell someone to calm down and then they're like, what are you talking about? Like you get really upset at you. You ever had that happen to you before? That's what it feels <laughs> like whenever I talk, talk to Toronto Maple Leafs fans. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame fans. Look, fans are fanatical by it's the definition, right? And and I'm not telling them what to do or what to think. You know, when you're asking me about the team, I'm giving you my more level-headed opinion, I think, on things. And But fans are eight years down the road of watching Matthews, Marner, Nylander. You know, this is year six with John Tavares on the roster. You know, they feel like they're they're not viewing it this one season, right? Like they're viewing it across the whole span of time. Um, and so I think that's why when things go wrong, you know, you see a real quick uh, panic kind of or chaos around the team. Um, you know, this is how I look at their current situation. What can they do? Like, what are, what are the things that could happen, right? You can fire your coach. And I don't have any sense at all that the Leafs at this stage are even contemplating that. But that's that's a thing teams do when they're they're struggling and they don't have other answers. They can make a trade off the roster, right? There's three players uh, that are pending UFAs. Uh, I'm looking at Tyler Bertuzzi, Max Domi, and TJ Brody. All have struggled to various degrees or or not fit in well. Um, You know, in terms of Domi and Bertuzzi, have not really found their groove as Leafs. Can you make a trade with one of them where you're you're sending money out and bringing money in? Maybe a struggling struggling player for struggling player kind of trade. And then when you look at the sort of more traditional deadline type moves, They've got a first round pick this year, but no second for the next couple of years. So they don't have a lot of pick currency. They've got Nick Robertson, a young player on the team that, that maybe they could look at moving. They have a couple of prospects that they've, they've taken the last few drafts. I'm thinking Fraser Minton, uh, maybe Easton Cowan, who they drafted in the first round last June. But, you know, I think that you got to be careful with dealing away your prospects because obviously this is a team that's going to need players coming up on entry level deals in the next few years to balance things out with the money they have at the top of the roster. So, I don't see a lot that they can do is like, is that's, that's sort of my conclusion. I'm not saying they won't do one or more of those things, but that's like when everyone is freaking out, like, let's just talk about it. Like those are, those kind of the three doors I see a kind of a roster player move. And, you know, a guy like Bertuzzi has a full no movement clause. So I'm not, it's not going to be easy. Domi's got a limited no trade clause. Brody's really struggled this year. Um, and then you got, uh, it's kind of a futures for a, a deadline ad. And they, but they don't have a lot of futures to deal is kind of the, the underlying there. And, and do you want to trade away your first round pick in a year like this where the team maybe isn't giving you a lot of reason to do so at this stage? And then a coaching change, which, you know, I don't think they want to do. They just gave Sheldon Keith an extension in the summer. At the same time, Brad Tree, it'd be kind of wild that if Brad Tree Living were to let go of Sheldon Keith, wouldn't this be like the second time in about a year that he's given an extension to someone? And that person has lasted, what, like how many months on the job post-extension? Daryl Sutter in Calgary was given an extension, and he didn't get to play out any of those years on that extension at the end of that deal. Right. And and look, sometimes that happens. I mean, the, the Oilers didn't start this year at all dreaming that they would ever be in a position to be firing Jay Woodcroft, right? I mean, the, hit, the winning percentage the team had under him was insane. They, they'd been to a conference final two years ago. They got to the second round last year. I mean, they... This was a team with a younger-ish head coach that looked like it was going to be a good match. And, you know, it's basically one bad four to six week stretch to start the year and he's out. And now it's replacement Chris Knobloch's looking like a a Jack Adams candidate. I mean, it's a wild position coaching. And, you know, Sheldon Keefe, I think specifically, is in a bit of a tough spot. He's been in Toronto a number of years now. 
you know, he's had a lot of cracks at playoff series where the team wasn't successful. I mean, the Leafs are similar to what I just mentioned with the Woodcroft example, because they've, they've had a really strong winning percentage under Sheldon Keefe in the regular season. I mean, even this year where everyone's freaking out, they're still on pace for about a 9,900 point season right now. So it's not as though, you know, they're not uh, failing spectacularly or anything like that, but you know, I, I suppose we could get to the point where that's a consideration. I just, I really don't think that's that's where the Leafs management wants to go with this. That you know, I'm sure they just hope things stabilize here and everyone moves on, and you know, we'll we'll have that conversation a little further down the road. But you know, I'm not making any excuses, but I'm I'm merely saying there's not a lot of options. Uh, you know, this this team kind of has to work as it is. Of course, there's some tweaks around the margins that'll probably happen, but I don't see any fundamental change coming through that door unless, you know, what, as we're recording here on Thursday morning is a four game losing streak. If it becomes a 10 game losing streak, okay, then this conversation will continue to evolve. But I, I, I don't think at this point, anyone internally is inclined to, to, you know, do anything panic like, or, or make any big, huge splashes. I just, I don't think those moves are out there for the Leafs. I don't know if that's acceptable for that fan base. I mean, I think you're, this isn't me trying to put my opinion on anything. I just feel as if taking the temperature of all those of fans who might hear that. I don't know if they could stand that considering what's gone on with this team the last how many years. And like the people are having conversations about how this roster once upon a time used to be this contending team. And people are wondering if they're even ready for the playoffs. Like the idea where, you know, not a lot of stuff could be done fine, but I, I, man, try serving that to that to that to those fans. You know, a, a lot of this goes back to last off season, right? I mean, it's still a. It, it, if you look back with it, even with the benefit of time now to consider things a little more thoroughly, to now have seen forty two games out of the current team, like it's kind of strange that the only major change in the organization last year was the GM change. You know, after you know another playoff defeat that that kind of left you scratch your head, even though the Leafs did win their first round series with Tampa, you know, kind of went out meekly against Florida in five games. Um, you know, you might've thought a head coach would pay the price for that, or maybe one of the core players would be traded away. It certainly sounded like Kyle Dubas, you know, had he continued on as a general manager was at least open to considering that for what would have been the first time in the, in the five years he'd run the team where he was thinking maybe they had to go to a different direction that being too top heavy at forward, in terms of the pay structure was, you know, you, you were just sacrificing too much in other parts of the the roster in order to make that work. And, and you weren't getting enough out of it. Um, you know, but then you bring in a new GM, he's only got a month on the job before any of those type of decisions would have to be made. Naturally. Yeah, I think it would have been a tough spot to come in. And I think Brad, Living was hired May 31st. Imagine if you're trading Mitch Marner on June 30th. Like, I just think that's, it's a tough thing to ask a new GM to do. And so a lot of this was sort of set in stone then. Um, and so, you know, I think ultimately what will satisfy Leaf fans is, is playoff wins, a long playoff run, you know, ideally a Stanley cup, but even signs of progress, right. If they go and play into the conference final and get to game seven or something this year, no matter what the regular season looked like, I think a lot of Leaf fans will say, okay, this team's moving in the right direction. And there is a, at least, I'm certainly not arguing that they look poised to do that right now. It just doesn't look to be the case. I will say this. The league is as wide open as I can remember it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of contending teams right now that are struggling, right? The LA Kings have had a terrible run here the last month. You know, Vegas is swamped with injuries and they've won, I think, four times in the last 14 games, something like that. Um, you know, I'm just picking a few up the top. The Rangers haven't been that hot lately. Like, there's a lot of teams that I think have cup potential that just haven't been at their best. And this trade deadline list, like, I don't want to spoil it. I know we want to play up the trade board. I want you to go look at it. It's really pretty. They did a nice job of the athletic, but it's not a sexy trade board. In fact, that went up this morning and I got a text from an executive and he said, can you ever remember a weaker trade list, you know, entering the deadline period? <laughs> and not, that's not a great way to sell the next segment. I want to bring up CJ. <laughs> I know, but let's be come real. On. The, the people come to us because we're real. It's, it's that's not true. look at, and, and there's seven weeks to the deadline, Julian. So, there could be some surprises still, right? There could be a team we're not even thinking about today that becomes a seller and, and has some pieces and adds some spice to that trade board. But the truth is, is it's a wide open, feels like it's a wide open field at the top of the league. There's not a lot of true impact deadline pieces right now, I feel, in play. 
it, like it's a weird year. And so I think if you're a team like the Leafs, you actually have to try to hang in. You have to hope in some ways some of these struggles will add like a little extra layer of a little callousness, you know, to the team. Maybe if they get through this, they'll be stronger for it. I think that most teams that go on and win a Stanley Cup have to go through some shit, both in the playoffs, but even the regular season. Um, and so, again, I'm not predicting that for the Leafs group, but I think you have to try to find the positives there if you're in management. And that's why I, I do think they're going to resist anything that we might label like major, major right now. I think that they're they're really going to try to get through this. You know, the 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 counter argument to everything, they've had leads in these last four games. So everyone's focused on the fact they've blown leads. Well, it's like they've had leads and all the games have been close. Um, you know, they need to find a way, though. I mean, there's no no way around it. They're they're now in a playoff chase, man. Like they they got dropped down to the wild card with, uh, you know, the win last night to, by the Red Wings, I believe. So um, this is they're they're in a true playoff chase, which is not something we, we could have said the last few years, really, since 1920 season when the Leafs went into that when the pandemic started in March of 2020. They were in a true playoff chase. Uh, they ultimately, of course, everyone went into the big 24 team playoff bubble after that. So it, it became moot. But there was a chance that team could have missed the playoffs. There's a chance the Leafs could now if they don't turn things around or get, you know, find their best game. And I mean, it's it's going to be interesting. Everyone was complaining the last few years about March and April being boring in Toronto. It's not going to be boring this year, bud. Be careful what you wish for. One final Leafs question before we actually delve into the trade board. What about the way that this team responds to adversity the last few days we've seen people go in on 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 mitch marner's comments acknowledging that there is i mean he's trying to show that he's not frustrated but it seems as if a lot of people wanted more urgency from what he's saying and sheldon keith is going out there saying there's no one on this roster he can trust is is it fair to That's say not that quite what he said okay can you can we at least clarify that he was saying he's he looks around at some of the newer players on the roster and he's not sure who he can trust. Like he's he, he wasn't saying there's no one he can trust. He was saying he, he like among the newer players of the team, he's not sure who to have out there in the key moments. You know, it's it's an indictment. That's still I suppose, bad. For sure. I'm not I'm not sugarcoating it, but like he I think he can he knows he can trust Austin Matthews with in a one goal game in the final minute. I mean, he's been trusting him for five years and the Leafs have had a lot of success. I mean, it's more, I think some of the defensive pieces, um, you know, with Brody struggling, you know, McCabe has had a tough year. Like the Leafs don't have, you know, I'm, I'm going back in time now, but they don't have the peak Jake Muzzin anymore. Like he was a great second pair defender for the Leafs. He really shut things down. Not a lot happened in the Leafs end when he was on the ice. They don't have that type of defender anymore. Um, and so, I, yes, it's, I'm not saying it, it, he didn't, it's casting doubt on the roster, but I think it's more, he's just saying he's still figuring out his team, basically like this version of it, the, the, the 23, 24 version of it. Um, and you know, that was a bit of candor from Keith there. And with the, <laughs> when it comes to the players, I'll tell I'll tell you, like, look at, they're free to say what they want. I like, it's not for me to put words in their mouth, but I do think that they could benefit from time to time, especially when things get rocky, which it is right now from a little bit more ownership of the situation like would it hurt any of them it doesn't have to be mitch marner to just say look this is not good enough we have a higher standard for ourselves in here in this dressing room i've got a higher standard for myself i can be better like we're gonna get out of this we're gonna work through it i'm gonna lead the way like like i think owning your shit a little bit for lack of a better phrase might might be a, a better look in terms of the narrative that swirls around the team because it just feels like you get in these moments and all of a sudden the blame goes to like the media or the fans or social media. Like it's always like this, this like monster that's outside the dressing room door, like this, this idea of noise or whatever. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm just surprised that the, especially the players that have been here so long, I'm surprised they still care quite honestly. Like, like they've been through this a lot. And, and the truth is if when they don't win, or and they go through a tough stretch, or if they're not scoring for a long period of time, there's just going to be stories in the market. There's going to be opinions and hot takes. Like, it, like, there's just nothing you can do to control that. All you can do to control that, I think, is just play better and, and to win more games. And and guess what? All the all the noise becomes happy noise that you love hearing, and everyone's pumping your tires and saying, oh, you only, you only took 11 and a half on that deal. It should have been 12 and a half. You can see so good. So it go, it swings both ways in the market and lots of markets. I mean, 
I think certainly the passionate Canadian ones are like this few in the U S and hockey, but you know, obviously the Yankees, the Cowboys, I mean, any, any of the big teams, the Lakers, there's, there's just a lot of voices and commentary and fans. And, and that's just the reality. Like, I don't know why it still feels like what I, what I hear in Mitch Marner's comments is he's like, he's like fighting that, right? Like he's, he's trying to push against that. And, and I think he should just almost embrace it, accept it, that it is what it is. Like some days he's not going to want to listen open his X feed or his Instagram. Like some days he's just going to want to avoid it all. Like I, and, and look at, I wouldn't blame him for that, but he can't really control it other than if the team has success, all that noise becomes a, a big happy song, about how great the Leafs are. Yeah. I still feel that if this team wins four or five in a row, all that we've talked about this week kind of goes out the window and people are happy about this, or maybe a little bit more relieved about this team. I shouldn't say happy, obviously, but there's a lot more they well, want to be happy about. You know what anyone hasn't talked about in Toronto for a week? No one's now talking about Austin Matthews being on pace for like 67 goals. Well, he's still on no. pace for 67 goals. But my point is, if if they win Thursday in Calgary and win Saturday in Vancouver and he scores another goal or two, everyone's going to be like, Austin Matthews on pace for 70. Can he do it? Right? Like, it turns from it turns from all the negative stuff to like some of the positive stories that are still right there on the roster. I mean, even, even Martin Jones, who started as a third stringer for this team, he's been a positive story. He's continued to play well. Some of these games that they've lost where he's been in net, it's it's not been on him, at least not to my eyes. I mean, there, there's lots of there's there's lots of good things going on too. It's just hard to see them when the team's blowing leads and losing games. I mean, that, that's you start focusing on the negative when that happens. I mean, again, this is just the nature of the beast. Like I, I'm not criticizing the media here. I'm not criticizing the players. Like th- we all just live in this world, man. Like this is how it goes. And and you're right. If they win four or five in a row. We're looking around at the trade board. And we're like, wouldn't this be a great add to this great team? Like, th- that's this is this is it, man. This is sports. It's it's crazy. It's not meant to be all rational. I wanted to actually. It's it's kind of funny. You almost stole my transition line here. Uh, you say, well, if there's anyone on the trade board that uh, the Leafs could be looking at, and this could also extend to other teams as well. This was just a transition towards your wonderful looking trade board, which you're right. It does look really nice on the athletic website. Great job to the graphics team. Yeah. They, I mean, they're it's, and it's funny. Cause like, they've told me some of the ways this might evolve over time. Like it's only going to get cooler and better. Like I think it's actually like, it's, it's neat. Cause obviously our job, I've never made any story look good. The ones I speak into a camera, the limitations are this, this face for newspapers. As my oh, dad stop says I got. this. Stop and, this. Uh, but but obviously the written word, it's always we're always relying on someone else to make the stories look nice and to put a good headline on it and all that stuff. But they're gonna I think they're gonna even keep evolving this over time. So it's gonna become more interactive and, and more probably updated more frequently. Like there's lots of cool things we can do. So even if this one isn't as loaded with top name talent as as some others might be, uh it still looks good. I mean, Elias Lindholm is a pretty good center. I get it fine on the Calgary Flames' number one center. Maybe on some contending teams that might want him, he might be a number two center. But let's let's not throw too much shade on an Elias Lindholm. No, and, and look, at the Flames are one of the teams. The Flames are the team, actually, that potentially could be moving, like, impact, like, multiple impactful players, right? Like, that's usually what a trade deadline needs. Like, think back to, like, when the Rangers rebuilt. And at the time... They were shipping out like Matt Zuccarello and Rick Nash and and Kevin Hayes like much earlier in his career. Like, you know, they, they dangled Chris Kreider. They ended up resigning him. But like there was a time, you know, like you need almost a chaos team that that has been a good team or and has a lot of good players. But it's just they're getting to the end of the road with that group like that. That's and, and I mean, preferably if you had multiple teams like that, then you'd have all kinds of good pieces. I, I think really we're kind of limited to Calgary in that respect, just because if you look at the other teams. Like the teams that are truly sellers that are at the bottom of the standings, you know, I'm looking at the Chicago's, the San Jose's, the Montreal's, you know, those teams have already kind of been selling the last number of years and they're, they're running low on the, the sort of pieces. I think that, you know, are true impact pieces it doesn't mean they don't have some good players and, and, you know, someone like Sean Monaghan's right up there near the top of the board in Montreal, because I know he's in, you know, pretty high demand. Certainly a lot of teams are at least calling on him to see, you know, what it might take to get them out of Montreal. So I'm not saying those teams have no pieces, but they don't, they're not really, do, they're already into the rebuild, right? They've already sold off a lot by this stage. You know, Ottawa is kind of interesting because they're at the you know bottom of the standings now or near the bottom of the standings. And they have some players that fall into that category. But, you know, to my, 
knowledge. They haven't say made a Jacob trick chicken available. That's why he's not on our board. I mean, I, I think that there's a world that that could happen. And so you're now not just talking about a rental player, you know, in Chikrin's case, he's got another year on his deal. He's 25 years old. So he's, he's a little different, a little more impactful kind of trade than, than some of the typical deadline deals. You know, you wonder, you know, Claude Giroux has a complete no move clause in Ottawa. He also has one more year in his contract. Would they ever think about asking him to waive? I don't think that's happened yet, but maybe, you know, I'm trying to look for places where we might get, you know, some more interesting decisions to come. And, and these things evolve. It's still seven weeks. Like that's, it's the funny thing. Everyone's like, when, what are the trades? Like every time I go on radio hits, they're like, what are the trades starting? And I was like, well, there, there will be deals obviously in advance of the deadline, but most teams are just having their pro scouting meetings now, which is where they basically make their, their game plan. They go through the players they think are available, all those types of things. And, and like, so usually no trades are really going to happen before those meetings have been had. I mean, essentially teams, I know they're, they're starting to have an idea and they've had some, conver- they're obviously having conversations internally, but like teams themselves haven't started to make these decisions yet. So I think we have to understand that it's a, it's a living, growing creature, this trade board. And uh, there's still seven weeks of twists and turns ahead. I love how you try your absolute best to temper everyone's expectations when it comes to these potential moves that could happen. And the very next thing I want to say They're is... They're going to happen, though. Like, that's... Sorry, I'm not I, saying I know, that. I, I, just... I, know, I, I know. I know. I know. I know. The next thing I was just going to say is... Link me some teams to some of these guys. Drive up the hype machine. Do it, CJ. Yeah, basically that. Well... Look at who needs forwards, right? Like, I think yes. I think some top teams that will be looking to add forwards before the deadline include Vancouver, Absolutely. Vegas, Boston, Colorado. I think Dallas uh, will be looking to add a, a forward potentially at this deadline. And so those are the teams I look at for Elias Lindholm, for example. Uh, I think that those are the kind of teams – that will be looking to to see if they can add him. Um, you know, it makes a lot of sense. A team like Boston, who I didn't mention, or Colorado, I, I think could really use basically a first or second line center, depending on how the lines might shake out if they were to add someone like Lynn Holman, and he could fill the job, right? And so some pretty dar- darn good teams out there with high expectations, I think will I think that's the that's kind of the group that will that will go for him. I think there's some overlap with Monaghan, not, not as impactful at the stage of his career, much cheaper on the cap. You know, he's, he's only on a $2 million cap hit. And I think Montreal would consider retaining half. So it might be a $1 million player, which has a lot of benefit to those teams up near the cap ceiling. Um, you know, he's a rental as well. And so I, I think that there's overlap between, you know, the same teams I just mentioned could easily be in on, on, or will be on, on a Sean Monaghan. I mean, I, I think that that's, that's why those two guys are up near the top. Um, you know, the defensive market's a little different. You know, we know Toronto is a team that's going to be looking for a defenseman. Uh, I think Dallas will look to add a defenseman. I could see Winnipeg adding maybe a more de- depth style defenseman. Um, you know, I didn't mention Edmonton. I could see Edmonton both forward and defense. Again, they got some cap challenges. So, it, you know, it's not necessarily the top names on the board, but as we go deeper down, um, yeah, so like I don't have a clear picture of who's going where just yet. Um, because again, I don't think those conversations have kicked into high gear, but that's where we can start to frame it for sure. And and absolutely you know, Lindholm at the top of the board is like he's had no conversations with the Flames this season on a contract. So like there's just unless something wildly changes at the last minute and they just roll out this amazing deal he can't refuse, it feels like you know. I know there's still some question about Noah Hannafin. Do they sign him? Do they not? Uh, and and that's been sort of on again, off again in terms of contract talks. I mean, it's been the, the polar opposite with Elias Lindholm. So like that's that's why he's at the top of the board because he's got six or seven top quality teams in the league that could use him, that are interested in him, and nothing's happening with the Flames. And so I don't know. I don't know if that satisfies your itch there a little bit, but Dude. there's it's a start. I have so many questions and so many follow-ups and, and so many other players I want to get to on the board. Just to kind of sprinkle in my own Calgary insight here, just like, what for Elias Leno, I, I, I kind of feel for him in a way. This is a guy who started the year letting everyone know he wanted to be here, and it seemed pretty clear that he obviously wanted the money that he wanted. And while he is going to be an all-star for this team, there have been so many other guys who have stood out 
on that team. Like a Blake Coleman has having a career year. Nazem Kadri has been playing a lot better as of late. Even guys like Mackenzie Weger and Jacob Markstrom. Markstrom's on the board uh, who have really stood out. And Lindham's just been okay, but not certainly someone who's, I think, worthy of being paid $9 million. I, I don't think it takes a genius to figure out what the really big holdup is in, in, in all of this. I guess, but they've never offered him that. So it's like he didn't turn down $9 million. Um, like this, I think the fact there's been no talks, like I, I, I honestly don't know what he would take. But the point is, of course, he entered the year. He's got high expectations. I think he'll be an in-demand free agent if he hits the, the open market on July 1st. Um, but like the fact that they haven't booted around the numbers in a meaningful way in months, I mean, it just shows the Flames, obviously, like it's fine. They don't have to pay on that. Like, I think the Flames, there's a good argument for doing a bit of a retool anyway. And, yeah. and how old is Lindholm? Is he 28? 28, 29? yeah. He's, he's, he's around my age, yeah. So if you're, I'm just saying, if you're looking at signing someone that age to a long-term deal and then you're going through a period where maybe you're not going to be, you know, like they're not in a competitive cycle, like it doesn't necessarily make sense. And it, it probably makes sense to get the kind of assets they can get by trading them. So uh, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. You're right. I think it's a tough spot for a player. I would have to imagine it's weighed on his shoulders a little bit this season. The some of the uncertainty, um, you know, like he's he's kind of had like a grab bag of line mates, from what I understand too. It's been um, a little better as of late. I mean, I know Huberto missed the last game, but there have been some changes up and down the lineup. But as of late, uh, Jaeger Sharangovich and Jonathan Huberto have worked alongside him. Huberto's looked a little bit more confident. Jaeger Sharangovich has been. He looks like he's about to have a career season. It looks as if Craig Connor is about to win that trade that he did with New Jersey in the offseason. So at least that's helped. But Huberto and Sharon Govich are a step down from Goudreau and Kachuk from that magical year he had in 2021-2022, of course. Yeah, with respect, they're a major step down. I mean... Yeah, with respect, yes, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's some of the dynamic that's that's playing out there. And, you know, you mentioned Markstrom. I think we've touched on him. We have. He's got to be on the board just because teams are interested and curious, and it's just such a year, weird year with the goaltending. But like, he's got a full no move. I don't think he's in any rush to get out of Calgary. My sense is he, it's been a good fit for him, and so I think it has to be almost a perfect type of situation. But I mean, when when you've got a former Vesna finalist and a player is having such a strong season as he is, even the fact that there could be just teams inquiring, I think it. So, you know, he's, he's somewhere around 20th on the board. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I would say that's, that one's not incredibly likely, but can't rule it out. Still just surprised at it, the fact that people have, have brought him up as a topic, but also just as surprised that it, at least in my eyes, and you could tell me differently now that a goalie market, it seems like there are options that are forming. Markstrom's name has been thrown out there. Elvis Merzlikens has openly discussed the idea of, of of being in a new area, being on a new team. Uh, Pierre Lebrun put out an article earlier this week suggesting maybe Mark Andre Fleury could be a trade target. We've seen guys like Jake Allen, Capo Kakinen have both been on the board as well. Uh, there are some goaltenders out there that are available. How likely do you think it is that teams may want to actually dish out assets for goaltending at the deadline? I mean, I, I just don't, goalies don't usually get back major assets. Um, but I, I do think we're going to see some goalies move. I mean, you look at New Jersey, you know, right at the bottom of the league and team save percentage and, and, you know, having a really difficult year after, you know, breaking through all expectations last season. So I, I think they're very much in the goaltending market, you know, Carolina, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Freddie Anderson's still working his way back from the blood clot issue. Um, you know, they've, They've played like four or five goalies already this year, but I can see them making a move. We'll see how things work out with Toronto and as Joseph Wall gets back from his high ankle sprain, if they feel they need to make a move at that spot. You know, Edmonton's really found a nice groove with Stuart Skinner, but, you know, could they bring someone in to, to be his number two? I don't think you can rule it out. You know, so there's a number of teams and, and there's also injuries and other situations that can crop up between now and March 8th. Yeah, you know, I think you're going to see a goalie move. You know, there's there's certainly been interest in Jake Allen, uh, who signed beyond the year. I think that's actually one of the holdups is that he's not just a rental. Oddly, like you you would think in some ways that could be a, a benefit to a team that they're not just giving up assets for a rental goalie, but in this case you'd have him sign for next season. But I think that that's kind of been one of the 
flies in the ointment so far. So I, you're going to see goaltenders move. I'm confident of that. Just whether we see one of the big contract ones move, and that would be Markstrom, that would be John Gibson in Anaheim, that would be Merzlikens in, in, in Columbus. I'm just not sure. Those are complicated trades midseason with the cap the way it is. And so I don't know if we see any of those guys ultimately move, even though all their names are out there in trade chatter. This episode of the Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Babbel. The best way to learn a language is through immersion. Living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards this year, you can still learn a language the second best way. And that's with Babbel. I've learned Spanish and German through classes in school in the past. And you know what? I've picked it up over an app or two. I know now with Babbel, I could be even better uh, than the uh, elementary school Spanish uh, I learned when I was a lot younger. And uh, Babbel, again, will be a big help with that. They have quick 10-minute lessons that are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start learning a new language in as little as three weeks. And uh, they're designed by real people for real conversations. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash Johnston. That's 55% off at babbel.com slash Johnston, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Johnston. Rules and restrictions may apply. Okay, what about uh, two other players on this list? Because I, I, I want to make sure that I, I, I keep your trade brain as fresh as possible here, so I won't get you to tap it on every single thing, but there are two players I want to ask about. Trevor Zegers, we've mentioned him before, and... More and more play, more and more teams are starting to get linked to him. Again, maybe maybe it's more just trade chatter, people just talking on the internet. I, I I know we're not trying to start any rumors here, but it is still interesting that a player of his age and and the potential ceiling that he could have is still available out there. We've seen people try to link him to Montreal. Maybe that's the elite piece that they need. Maybe it's a Chicago. The idea of putting Trevor Zegers with a Connor Bedard. What else are you hearing about Trevor Zegers right now? Well, unfortunately, he had ankle surgery last week, and he's out six to eight weeks. And so I don't know how that impacts things, because essentially that window is means he's going to be out until about the trade deadline. You know, he is only 22. He signed beyond the year. Like, it's not a player. This is not a trade that has to happen at this deadline. It, you know, could be a summer move. And even then, it doesn't have to be then. But I think the reason it's happened is, you know, he, he wasn't having the strongest of seasons, you know, when he was healthy. Uh, obviously the, the ducks I think are, you know, they've, they've already moved out Jamie Drysdale and the cutter Goche deal. Like I think that at Verbeek's putting a stamp on a team. It's no secret with Zegris, you know, he's had two 60 plus point campaigns already, but you know, I think the ducks have really tried to push him to round out his game to be more of a 200 foot game to, to play a little more in his defensive end. You know, he's pretty one-sided offensive player at this earlier stage of his NHL career. And so you know, there's been a bit of friction there or there's, you know, that's that's been a push the organization's put on. You know, it's it's something we see happen with a lot of players. You know, it, it wasn't that long ago in Toronto. That was all the talk with William Nylander, right? And and that, that you know, over time, William became more consistent and, and his game grew and it's not really discussed so much anymore um, because he, you know, he was able to round things out more and obviously he's grown offensively too. And so, you know, I think that there's a danger in training a player too early in their career. Um, but with, with the ducks, I mean, certainly the Zegers name is out there and again, I don't know if this ends up being more of a summer deal than a a deadline deal, but you know, we'll see if anyone steps up and, and, you know, I think that it's a pretty tantalizing name too, right? Especially when we look at the rest of the names on the, the board, there's not that many younger players I would say on it. And, and so let's see, tune in. Okay. Yeah. One more, one other name, and I'm I'm more interested, I guess, with what the team does. Jake Gensel and the Pittsburgh Penguins. This is a team, as of right now, still outside the playoff picture. Wouldn't it be interesting? An idea just popped in my head. Wouldn't it be fascinating if the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Pittsburgh Penguins battled for the playoff spot on the final day of the season? What a crazy story that would be. Anyway, that's something we could we could table for April. But right now, this Pittsburgh team, obviously with the frontline players that they have, it's very important for them to win. But if they're not in a position to win, they might need to get some assets some way. Maybe Jake Gensel is that player to do that for them. Well, they don't have a lot of prospects, right, in Pittsburgh. 
And for obvious reasons, they've been an all in team for 15 years, basically, as an organization. So they've traded a lot of picks and prospects away over the years. I think that that process has to start as much as they're still trying to win in the moment. You know, I think they do have to start to look longer term. And Gensel's a pretty good chip to play if Kyle Dubas elects to play it. Now, you know, I, my sense of where the Penguins are at is that, you know, Dubas is willing to let the team kind of instruct what he does. And in, in, in a sense that, you know, if they go on a solid run here and are clearly in the playoff window, if, if they look like they are going to make the playoffs, I mean, maybe he keeps Gensel as an own rental, so to speak. Uh, because I don't, I don't get the sense either side is all, it's not that they don't want to talk. Like Jake Gensel loves Pittsburgh. Like that's not the issue here, but it's about, is he the right player for that organization at the right time? You know, he's 30 years old. Um, do they want to be signing him to a seven or eight year deal at this point where, you know, we do know that the rebuild is somewhere on the horizon. We maybe can't see it fully yet, but it's, it's not, it's not five years away. It's probably two years away or three years away. Um, and so, you know, I think really where that'll be interesting, let's put it this way. It gets to March 1st. We're, we're a week from the deadline. And let's say Pittsburgh's in a playoff spot by one point or right on the line or out by one point. And so they're not clearly, you don't know exactly where they are. Like how, how Penguins management would navigate that potential scenario, I don't know. But I do think certainly if they fall back and they're six or seven points out, you know, as we get close to the deadline, I, I think Gensel's certainly a, a chip that they'll play. And then if they're well in, they probably don't move him um, because let's face it, he's, I mean, he's having a great year this year. He's on pace for like 37 goals and 90 points. Uh, he's been Sidney Crosby's, you know, a, a constant line mate of a player who's having a season that we probably haven't talked up enough uh, given his age, just how, how singularly brilliant it's been by Crosby. And so do you really want to take away one of his favorite players to play with when he's having that season? And if the team is right at the, on the precipice of the playoffs, um, but, you know, the beauty is, you know, I, I think that the relationships are really strong there between the Gensel camp and, and the Penguins. Like, I don't I don't sense there's any everyone just knows that this this could be a big decision that's going to come up. And, and I think a lot of the decision will be made by where the Penguins are in the standings, how they're playing, what they show management. I think that they'll tell Kyle Dubas what to do, so to speak, with with that. Okay, that's a lot to take in off of uh, a handful of players on the trade board, which, again, you can check out on the Athletic website. One name you won't find there. And let me uh, scrub the part where I said it's a boring list. It's it's just not. Yeah. I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, Julian. I've heard that phrase a lot. Uh, the Tampa Bay <laughs> Lightning is the next topic I want to hear. Uh, well, I want to get to uh, because Steven Stamkos is a name you're not going to find on the, the trade board list. Uh, Julian Brisebois, the GM of the Lightning, saying uh, he is not going to trade him. And we've heard GM say that before, but I'm inclined to believe him. This is a franchise player. He's done so much and won so much with that organization. It seems as if negotiations would continue, will, will likely kind of pick up in the summer. I'm curious, for a guy like Steven Stamkos at this point in his career, what do you pay him? What what do contract negotiations even look like? What would he even want uh, for for a next contract? I, I I would imagine he would want to stay in Tampa. Maybe he doesn't. I, I'm not him, but I'm curious about what that could look like. He wants to stay in Tampa. I mean, look at he's got th that Lightning team, and, and who knows what they can still accomplish. But what they've already accomplished, we might never see it again. Like quite seriously. If you go from 2015 to today, so almost a nine-year period, in a nine-year period, they went to four Stanley Cup finals. They won two of them. They twice lost uh, game seven of the Eastern Conference final. You know, they have by far the most wins, goals, like any any metric of that era. They, they, they were clearly the best team of an era. And it's obviously harder and harder to do as the league expands to 32 teams and maybe beyond in the future with the cap and everything associated with that. I mean, and and Steven Stamkos has been the face of it all. He's been the captain forever. I mean, his time there goes all the way back to 2008, right? And you know, they were they were lost as a franchise at that time, but they they drafted Stamkos and Hedman in consecutive drafts, and those guys have been pillars. Obviously, the, there's so much Hall of Fame talent that's been added around them over the years. The, the Kucherovs and the Vasilevskis and and Braden Point and and other great players that have been maybe more supporting pieces like Palat and Kalorn and. Tyler Johnson and other players that helped that, that organization have success. But add that all up. In a perfect world, Steven Stamkos, he wants to play 20 years in a lightning sweater. 
That's what he wants to do. I think this is year 16. So I think a four or five year extension for him would probably be perfect. You know, this is where it gets tricky. And he has a no movement clause, by the way. So I don't think that there was any world he was ever getting traded because, you know, I don't think he was necessarily consenting to a trade either. I think Julian Breesbaugh, the point of saying that when he spoke to reporters this week was just to like, before there could ever even be speculation, like let's end it all right now. Um, The biggest issue for the Lightning is they have 41 million committed to nine forwards already next season. And so I'm guessing the right number for Stamkos is somewhere, depending on the term, between 5 million a year to 7 million a year, something like that. I mean, look at, he's, he's still scoring at a point a game. Still got a great shot, real power play threat. Um, you know, brings the intangibles and the leadership. I mean, look at Alex Klorin, who I mentioned. He he signed for six and a quarter times four with Anaheim, you know, in, in free agency last year. I'm pretty confident that that same deal would be out there for Steven Stamkos on the open market on July 1st if he if he hit there, at minimum. And I'm, I'm not saying he, maybe it's more than that from someone else. And so the fair market value again, depending on how many years you go, is probably between five and seven million. And the truth is, is the Lightning and Stamkos' agents, they've, they haven't discussed contracts. Like going all the way back to last summer, they never had a conversation about what fair would be or is there a discount to be given? Is there some kind of way they can make this work for both sides? I think they'll try to do that in the summer. But when you already have 41 million, Julian, Committed to a core. Remember, Brandon Hagel has a big extension that kicks in next season. He's getting a $5 million raise. And so the salary cap's due to go up by, what, four and change? Like, the, the entire bump in the salary cap that every team is getting is is going to Brandon Hagel next year in Tampa, just by virtue of the fact his contract's going up by that amount. And so my point is, they're already a tight cap team as it is. You know, he's he's getting a huge bump. I don't know if they could pay five or seven million at this point for Stamkos. And maybe there's another deal that can be worked out. We've seen Julian Breesbois. I mean, he's, he's not afraid of a hard decision. Like days after a third straight cup final appearance, he goes to one of his warriors, Ryan McDonough, who had a no movement clause and basically said, we need you to waive that and trades him to Nashville. Uh, obviously he's had to, to watch players like Plot uh, go and in, in free agency Kalorn. You know, Johnson, they lost Yanni Gord to Seattle in the expansion draft. Um, I mean, there's just players all over the league. There's there's former Lightning players all over the league that it, that are heart and soul guys, parts of that team that they just had to let go for salary cap reasons. I think there's a world that Stamkos could join them. It's too, too premature to say that with any certainty. Um, but it's going to be an interesting summer there. And and so really what this this comment this week does is it just, just delays – like that's just beneath the surface there. I got to tell you, this is one of the buzziest topics in the NHL this year. Like when I'm just chatting casually with a player I may know, have a relationship with, like a, it's this has come up more than once, not directed by me. Like I think a lot of players are looking at it because legacy players that have won cups and been captains and been as important to an, a franchise as Stamkos has been to Tampa, it usually doesn't play out like this, right? I mean, it did a little bit, if you remember in Pittsburgh, both uh, Chris Letang and Evgeny Malkin got within days of potentially becoming free agents a couple of years ago before they got extensions. So it's not that. it's not completely unprecedented, but but typically when you have a player of Stamkos's ilk, you, you try to sign them as long as you can, as soon as you can, because they they there's sort of an intangible value that they bring. I, you know, unfortunately, the cap, it's this is all cap driven, right? This isn't there's nothing. It, this is just business. Like it's not. We shouldn't turn this at all into a personality thing. I don't think it's like, it's not like Julian Breesbaugh wants to drive Stamkos out of town. I just think the market forces at play might be what ultimately drives him out of town. We're going to have to see how things go in the summer. Could you imagine if, do you, do you remember in 2016 when for months we speculated about which city Steven Stamkos would end up in? I think it was the hockey news that had the cover where you have Steven Stamkos doing all these different poses and he's wearing all the, they I, maybe they photoshopped it, but they have him wearing all these different jerseys. Could you imagine he's won all the cups? He's had all the success. He's, getting, he's, he's still 33 now, but if this is the summer that all kind of comes back, like that would be so wild. It would be, I think at the time is off the top of my head. So I, I might, some things might be lost to time a little bit, but I think it was Buffalo, Toronto, Detroit, and San Jose. I think we're, the main bidders for Stamkos at that point in time, if 
you know, had he decided to leave Tampa, right? He took meetings, right? He took a meeting with the Leafs. They brought the mayor. They famously brought like one of the, the big muckety mucks from Canadian Tire. Like they were, they were sort of saying like, if you come here, like you're going to have sponsorship opportunities, you wouldn't and, and all that type of stuff. Uh, ultimately it was that meeting with the Leafs, I think where he's like, okay, let's end this charade. I don't, I don't want to go anywhere. Um, not that he, you know, I think he was curious naturally. He, he wasn't doing, he was at the time they had the interview period. It was, he was doing what was allowed under the rules, but, uh, ultimately took the deal that, that Tampa had on the, had on the table for a long time. Muckety mucks is a word I've never really heard used before. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean? Like one of the big, I don't know if it was a CEO or the chief financial officer, who it was, but it, but it was, I know it was one of the top executives. I'll be from, from Canadian Tire was there, plus the mayor at the time and a whole bunch of other, you know, it was a real song and dance, right? They were, I mean, that was what that interview period was about. Remember when John Tavares was a free agent, Julian? He had Tampa, actually, yeah. Boston, Dallas, San Jose, and Toronto. Um, and he actually went, to his his agent uh, CAA's headquarters in in LA there, and teams made presentations. And part of part of what brought him to Toronto, obviously, there was the family ties and everything, and 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 all that. And but and at the time, they had all these young stars. Like it was a good place to land, but also it was a presentation that Kyle Dubas gave um, in, in that meeting. So he could have been a San Jose Shark, John Tavares. They offered him ninety one million. 13 times seven. He ended up signing for 77 million in Toronto. Um, or he could have been a Bruin. Imagine that. Or, or a lightning. I mean, it's just a funny. lot of like, what you go back. Yeah. I mean, Tampa had Tampa end up with all these cap troubles anyway. Like what would, I don't know what they would have signed him to, but let's presume, you know, there's always that Florida discount. So maybe he would have taken nine and a half or 10 there because it's more real money, whatever. But like, imagine what the downstream effects of that would have been. Tampa would have lost probably other players sooner just because that cap space was committed. I mean, they might have still won all the cups. Like, I'm not like, it might have ended up with the same result, but I mean, there's a lot of what ifs out there in history. What, how do you feel about the idea? This is just us workshopping here. How do you feel about the idea if we actually like make that a thing? Like, every week, like, I ask you to be like, can you tell us a what if, a, like, a move that could have happened, a trade that could have happened, a free agency move? Maybe it's like a GM that could have gone to one place, but it's going somewhere else. Or I, don't, I, I would like that. There's, there's, I think a lot of yeah, people like, would love that idea. We like that. We need a name for it because uh, we like to we like to brand our segments. But I think I think that's doable. I mean, th- there's probably a certain point where I'll run out of stories. Fair. But I could say between now and the trade deadline, if we're doing that, say once a week, maybe not both episodes. I, I've probably got enough just off the top of my head to do to do eight or ten of those anyway, and maybe. Who knows? Maybe I'll start doing them and people will start whispering in my ear or whatever. Yeah, that, that's, actually, that's actually not a bad idea. Uh, if you have any, uh, if you've heard like, hey, did you hear about the possibility of when this player could have almost been in this jersey? Like write them in the Discord, tweet at us. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss it. We'll even take submissions from the audience. Why not? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I was thinking some of my sources might be like, hey, I see the segment you're doing. Did you know oh. back in at the 2015 deadline, our team almost did X? Like, who knows? Like that. Oh, that, that's actually really true. That's I'm trying actually... to manifest it, that that some of these things will just come to me then. <laughs> that's actually a good idea. I think people uh, like that stuff. You get to a safe distance, do. especially if players are either retired or at the end of it. Like, I, I think it's actually one of the cool things that usually comes out at Hall of Fame. Um, like, you know, when players go in the Hall of Fame, they usually have these big availabilities and, and you can usually just go back and say, hey, you were traded this time. Like, what, did you, what else was happening? Like, you usually get those stories once they're they're a safe distance away. I actually know one and I, I'm not going to go too crazy here. I know one trade that involves two extremely frontline players on teams that was almost done one for one, like two or three years ago. OK, um, but like that's one I couldn't put out yet because it would just it's just not worth the headache. But when those players get to towards the end of their careers or retire, I do have one that'll be good to flush out. But this podcast is going to have to live like another seven or eight years, I think, for that to happen. I have a question. Is this trade that you're not willing to talk about, is it on the level of like a P.K. Subban for Shea Weber? Yeah, I would argue above that. Okay. So, wow, that's pretty okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're talking yeah, okay. like we're talking about players at, at any given time are considered among the absolute best in the league. Like n- not, not, not number one. I'm not hinting at Connor McDavid just to like, but like, no. 
But play, but players that have at various points in their careers been in the conversation, say to be best 10 in the league at any given moment, were nearly traded one for one for each other. And it might have been four or five years ago now, three years ago, whatever it was. But uh, anyway, I'm going to stop there because at some point you're going to have to just... start revealing some of this stuff because you got all this stuff in your head that you're just going to tease for people and no one's going to know about it. You, there are people right now who are like, we want to know about that Leaf player who was supposed to be a Leaf that you're not going to tell us. Okay. I will say it's way above what that leaf thing was too, like in terms of Damn, the status okay. of the players. So. Shoot, and it, and okay. It didn't, and I'm going to say this too. The last thing is that this trade that didn't happen did not involve the Leafs either. So let's just, because I don't want crazy leaf fans that I mentioned six years from now bringing up this exact conversation because I know it'll happen if they think it involves the Leafs. So this was not a trade involving the Leafs. Let's, potential let's trade. Not, let's not get you in any more trouble. Uh, we should probably get to stick taps. Uh, do you have a stick tap for this week? You go first. Uh, why not give it to uh, Jumbo Joe Thornton, who's uh, supposed to get his number 19 retired in San Jose. Uh, legend, uh, legendary Joe Thornton. Obviously, he spent part of his career in Boston, but we all remember him with the long, lustrous beard in San Jose. Well-deserving of such an honor for him, uh, Jumbo Joe. I'm willing to give the stick tap to him. What about you? That's fair. Do you remember when he fought Nazem Kadri? And Nazem accidentally, like, took a chunk out of his beard. Beard. Yep. I remember that. I very much remember that. Man, I don't have a stick tap. Is that bad? I thought Terry Ryan was going to be yours. I mean, I didn't even think of that. That's a great one, though. I got to tell you, I know I teased this uh, on the last show. I ended up talking to Terry on Monday for probably 45 minutes. Like, there, there is so much to that guy. Like, just an interesting character. Um, and I love the story of him getting in a game so random, like under the most random of circumstances, like, like five things had to line up for that to ever be a possibility. Um, and I love that he went out and defended a teammate and, and I love most quite frankly, that he got to play a professional game in front of his daughter. Uh, cause yeah. he, he was telling me that she was just so excited to see her dad play a game. She was born seven years after his last professional game. She's now 13. And she was there with all her, her friends at, at the rink and got to see him go out there and play. And he said she was just buzzing. So that was that was a cool little story. And, uh, you know, Terry's had an interesting life. And I think he's a really because he's a very smart, sensitive, kind of introspective guy, too. So, like, it's really interesting that it happened to him because he had all these, like, deep thoughts that he was able to articulate. Like, you know, I think some people, they just wouldn't have words to put to what that experience was like. But I thought he was... He was so good at just explaining about what it meant to him, how he was saying there was no way in his 20s if he had had a big send-off game, he could have even, like, he wouldn't have been in a spot in his life where he would have appreciated it. But he's, like, being 47, like, you're like, this is just crazy that this is happening. So um, I don't know if you saw the story I wrote at The Athletic, but... Oh, I know, definitely Terry's, did. I definitely wrote Terry's it. Done I, some, I, uh, not, not only did I read it, I texted you right after I read it to be like, you did a great job with the story, CJ. It Thanks, was really buddy. well done, and you deserve that credit for it. And everyone who listens or watches the show should read the story on the Athletic website. Yeah. I love, I love a good story. I love an unexpected twist. I love a certain character getting rewarded. It's honestly why I've loved over the years covering the playoffs, because there's always an overtime winner in the playoffs scored by like the most random player, right. Who gets kind of rewarded. And, and like, you know, I, I just think there's always a lot of beautiful stories because really when you think about it, there's so much struggle to get to a moment where you could ever to get to that minute where you could have that moment. And so that's, that's, what's great about the Stanley cup. It's what's awesome about being on the ice when the cups won. Cause you see the families and there's just, there's so much texture there. Um, and I'm getting excited, man. Like we're in the second half of the season. I don't know how that happened. But like we're in the run up to the deadline now. We're we're getting to the point where the playoff races are real, and we're not very far, really. Like all things being equal, from the start of the Stanley Cup playoffs, which is just nuts. Oh my God! Don't get me excited already for that. I'm 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 hyped as much as you are right now, to be quite honest with you. And you can trust uh, if you're watching or listening to this, we'll be there every step of the way, right until that mug is lifted, and then the draft, and then the free agency uh, period as well, and then we'll take nice vacations through july and august i think we both deserve it especially you that's too far off to even think about but yes it it will be happening i don't have any plans yet subscribe to our podcast however you listen to our show subscribe to the sdpn youtube channel we'll be back on monday get your questions in now for ask cj uh send them in on discord send them in on 
Twitter slash X. I know you're more comfortable using X. I still can't use X. Twitter is what, or th- if you're not on threads. If you have questions on threads, I guess you can, wherever you want to get us questions, send us questions. We'll do our best to get them on the Monday edition of the Chris Johnston show. Packed one today. We'll be back with more stuff next week. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter, at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie, at JK and McKenzie.